Hello, welcome my friends and colleagues in new video of our YouTube channel. Number 1 Doctor, today we'll have a lecture. Hope you enjoy, get benefits. But before we start the lecture, do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel Number 1 Doctor. Like the video, share the video on social media. Follow us on our social accounts below the description. If you have any ideas, leave it in comments below the video. Okay Doctor, can we start the lecture now? Okay, we will start soon. Hello. Today I will talk about skull volvulus. Okay, doctor, what is the cecal volvulus? A cecal volvulus is the rotation or torsion of a flexible scum and ascending colon, frequently progressing to bowel obstruction, ischemia, necrosis, and perforation. Volvuli can occur at other sites in the alimentary tract, including the sigmoid colon, stomach, gallbladder, splenic flexure, and small bowel. What about the epidemiology of cecal volvulus? The incidence of cecal volvulus ranges from 2.8 to 7.1 per million people per year. Cecal volvulus accounts for approximately 1 to 3 percent of all large intestinal obstructions. Depending upon the series and age of the patients, cecal volvulus represents 10 to 52 percent of all cases of colonic volvuli. For example, a retrospective review of 137 patients with a colonic volvulus identified the following segments involved. Sacum 52%, sigmoid 43%, transverse colon 3%, splenic flexure 2%, pitians with a cecal volvulus are young, with a mean age varying from 33 years in India to 53 years in Western countries. In contrast, sigmoid volvulus usually occurs in elderly subjects with chronic constipation or distal colon obstruction. The patients are often institutionalized and debilitated with neurologic and psychiatric conditions, such as Parkinson disease and schizophrenia. What are the pathophysiology of cecal volvulus? There are three types of cecal volvuli. Type 1 cecal volvulus develops from clockwise axial torsion or twisting of the sacum around its mesentery, including the ascending colon and terminal ilium. Type 2 loop volvulus develops from a counterclockwise axial torsion of the sacum around its mesentery, including the ascending colon and terminal ilium. Type 3 cecal bascule involves the upward folding of the scum rather than axial twisting. Type 1 and Type 2 axial torsion cecal volvuli are the most common and account for approximately 80% of cecal volvuli, while cecal bascule accounts for approximately 20%. All three types require a mobile sacum and ascending colon, whether congenital or acquired. A cecal volvulus typically occurs in patients who have inherently increased cecal mobility, hypothesized to result from a congenital failure of the fusion of the ascending colon mesentery and the posterior parietal peritoneum. Based upon autopsy studies, approximately 10 to 25% of the population has a sacum and ascending colon with sufficient mobility to develop a volvulus. Acquired anatomic abnormalities, such as surgical adhesions, can also contribute to the development of a cecal volvulus. Clinical settings that have been associated with cecal volvulus include pregnancy, colonic atony, colonoscopy, hash springs disease, and mobile scum syndrome. What are the clinical presentation? The clinical presentation is highly variable, ranging from insidious, intermittent episodes of abdominal pain to an acute abdominal catastrophe. Most patients present with a gradual onset of steady abdominal pain superimposed with cramping pain associated with peristalsis, as well as nausea, vomiting, and obstipation. The duration of symptoms also varies from hours to days. The physical examination is also variable, with fever and hypotension present in the patient with vascular compromise, with or without perforation. Patients with a partial or complete bowel obstruction without ischemic bowel may have a normal temperature, blood pressure, and heart rate. The abdomen is generally diffusely distended and tympanitic, but in some clinical settings, the abdomen can be asymmetrically distended with tympani only in the mid-abdomen or the right or left upper quadrant. Rebound tenderness can be elicited in the clinical setting of peritonitis or ischemic bowel. What are the investigations to be done? 1. Imaging studies. CT scan, computerized tomography scan, CT scan, demonstrates the world sign twisting of the mesentery around the aleocolic vessels, which is pathognomonic of axial cecal volvulus. CT scan can also demonstrate a massively dilated scum with associated small bowel dilation and signs of colonic or small bowel ischemia such as mural thickening and mesenteric edema. For patients with cecal bascule, CT scan can show the scum folding upward, resulting in obstruction, 
Without the axial twist of the mesentery point two contrast studies, a single contrast barium or hypake enema demonstrates a tapered up bird's beak narrowing in the right colon, confirming a cecal volvulus. In cecal bascule, the termination of contrast is rounded as a result of the transversely folded sacum. In a retrospective review of 568 patients with cecal volvulus, barium enema was diagnostic in 88%. And abdominal plane film suggested the diagnosis in 46% of patients, but was diagnostic in only 17%.3 upright abdominal plane films. A plain upright abdominal film reveals the classic coma or coffee bean shaped scum with an air fluid level in approximately 25% of patients. The dilated sacum is typically displaced medially and superiorly, although it can be displaced anywhere in the abdomen. In addition, the proximal small bowel is distended with air fluid levels while the distal colon is decompressed. Cecal bascule can demonstrate similar findings with a more central position of the dilated sacum. Free air can be identified under the diaphragm in the clinical setting of a bowel perforation. Point four laboratory studies. Laboratory studies are not diagnostic of cecal volvulus. However, leukocytosis may indicate a perforation or gangrenous, necrotic bowel. Vomiting associated with a bowel obstruction can result in hyperkalemia and other electrolyte imbalances. How can you diagnose a case of cecal volvulus? CT scan confirms the diagnosis of cecal volvulus in approximately 90% of patients. The remainder are diagnosed at the time of an exploratory operator procedure, laparotomy or laparoscopy. A history and physical examination alone cannot confirm the diagnosis. Plain abdominal radiographs can diagnose a large intestine obstruction, but are insufficient to confirm the diagnosis of cecal volvulus in most patients. An intestinal obstruction should be suspected when a patient presents with symptoms that include abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting, and a physical examination that reveals a distended and tympanic abdomen. However, the specific diagnosis of cecal volvulus is rarely made by the history and physical examination alone. Systemic findings, such as fever or hypotension, and leukocytosis may indicate necrotic bowel or perforation. The diagnostic evaluation includes an upright abdominal plane film to identify an obstruction or pneumoperitoneum. No further diagnostic imaging is necessary for patients with a pneumoperitoneum, they should be prepared for an immediate operative procedure. In the clinical setting of an obstructive process, a CT scan can be obtained to delineate the location of the obstruction as well as the presence of ischemic bowel. A CT scan demonstrating a world sign confirms the diagnosis of cecal volvulus in most patients. A contrast enema, barium or hypake, can be performed if the CT scan is non-diagnostic. Contrast studies are contraindicated in the clinical setting of necrotic bowel or pneumoperitoneum. In addition, the contrast should be gently inserted to avoid colonic perforation. An exploratory operative procedure, laparoscopy or laparotomy, is a diagnostic tool that should be used when imaging studies fail to establish a diagnosis in a patient with worsening obstructive symptoms or an abdominal catastrophe. What are the differential diagnoses of cecal volvulus? 1. Sigmoid volvulus. Sigmoid volvulus is the axial torsion of the sigmoid colon, which often leads to a bowel obstruction and ischemia. In contrast to patients with a cecal volvulus, sigmoid volvulus usually occurs in elderly subjects who are often institutionalized and debilitated with neurologic and psychiatric conditions such as Parkinson's disease and schizophrenia. 2. Mobile sacum syndrome. Mobile sacum syndrome occurs when the sacum and ascending colon lack a posterior peritoneal attachment. Patients typically present with chronic right lower quadrant abdominal pain and abdominal distension that is relieved with passage of flatus or stool. 3. Transverse colon volvulus and splenic flexure volvulus. The transverse colon and splenic flexure can each become tossed and form a rare large intestinal volvulus. Patients present with abdominal pain and distension, and the volvulus can result in bowel obstruction, ischemia, and perforation. These patients typically have a mobile transverse colon or splenic flexure as a result of a congenital or acquired loss of colonic attachments. The evaluation is similar to that described for a cecal volvulus. 4. Aleosigmoid knotting. Aleosigmoid knotting is a rare condition in which the distal ileum wraps itself around the base of the sigmoid colon, resulting in a closed loop colonic obstruction. It is more frequently diagnosed in patients residing in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East than in the US. 5. Gastroc volvulus. Gastroc volvulus is rare and characterized by rotation of the stomach along its long or short axis, leading to variable degrees of gastric outlet obstruction, which may present acutely or chronically.
Presentation typically includes abdominal or chest pain, nausea, and vomiting. 6. Distal small bowel obstruction A patient with a distal small bowel obstruction can present with abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal distension. Plain abdominal films reveal distended loops of small bowel with a paucity of air in the colon. 7. Ischemic bowel mesenteric ischemia, either acute or chronic, is caused by a reduction in intestinal blood flow and can result in bowel infarction and sepsis. 8. Scald diverticulitis Scald diverticulitis usually occurs in young adults and presents with signs and symptoms of right-sided abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. 9. Appendicitis Acute appendicitis typically begins with mid-abdominal pain that radiates to the right lower quadrant and can be associated with nausea and vomiting. The symptoms of appendicitis vary depending upon the location of the tip of the appendix. Fever and leukocytosis are associated with a perforation. 10. Right lower quadrant abdominal pain differential additional intestinal, gynecologic, obstetrical, and urologic clinical settings that can be included in the differential diagnosis of right lower quadrant abdominal pain are reviewed elsewhere. What is the management of cecal volvulus? The management include operative and non-operative. Operative management The optimal management for patients with a cecal volvulus is operative. The suggested procedure is a right colectomy or an oleocecal resection with an oleocolic anastomosis, based upon retrospective and consecutive patient series, although cecopexy or colopexy, and scostomy, alone are in conjunction with the resection. However, no randomized trials have been performed to determine the optimal surgical procedure. Laparotomy or a laparoscopic approach can be used, although the preferred approach is laparotomy in the clinical setting of greatly distended bowel, Operative management is based upon intraoperative findings and patient stability, volvulus without ischemia, necrosis, or perforation, if the colon is viable, datation is performed in conjunction with a bowel resection, such as a right colectomy or a leucolic resection. A right colectomy removes the sacrum and entire ascending colon, while an leucolic resection leaves a remnant of ascending colon. If the entire ascending colon is mobile, then a right colectomy is preferred. If only the sacrum is unattached to the posterior parietal peritoneum, the more limited oleocolic resection can be performed. Recurrence rate of cecal volvulus after right colectomy is essentially zero, however the mortality rate after resection ranges from less than 5 to 18 percent. Intraoperative dutition alone is associated with a failure rate ranging from 13 to 75 percent. Colopexy of the right colon remnant to the posterior peritoneal wall has been performed to prevent volvulus recurrence following an oleocolic resection, with no evidence of recurrence in one series of 10 consecutive patients. If an oleocolic resection is performed, a colopexy should be considered to reduce the risk of recurrence. Cecopexy can be performed alone, in conjunction with a cecostomy tube placement or with appendectomy to encourage formation of adhesions to reduce the mobility of the sacrum. The recurrence rates vary from 0 to 28% and the mortality rates range from 0 to 14%. Cecostomy tube placement can decompress the right colon, but is typically reserved for debilitated or unstable patients. Ongoing intraperitoneal fecal contamination, surgical site infections, and collocutaneous fistula are complications of this procedure. The recurrence rate is low 2 to 14% due to the adhesions created between the sacrum and the abdominal wall, but the mortality rates are high, ranging from 0 to 33%, most likely reflecting the range of patient comorbidities or clinical instability, volvulus with ischemia, necrosis, or perforation, an oleocolic resection or a right colectomy, without a dutition maneuver, is performed when ischemia, necrosis, or perforation is present. The type of resection depends upon the extent of ischemic or gangrenous bowel, as well as the mobility of the ascending colon. It is unlikely that sufficient reperfusion will occur following datition. In addition, surgical datition is not suggested for gangrenous or necrotic bowel as reperfusion may promote bacteremia and sepsis. If the patient is clinically unstable, an ileostomy rather than a primary oleocolic anastomosis can be performed. A cecostomy is the primary operative procedure should not be performed for any but the most clinically unstable patients. The mortality rate for patients with gangrenous cecal volvulus ranges from 17 to 40 percent. Non-operative management We do not suggest non-operative management like colonoscopy, reduction barium enema for dutition of a cecal volvulus because of the 20 to 25 percent risk of concurrent cecal necrosis, failure rates with non-operative procedures approaching 95 percent, and risk of colon perforation in addition, 
Colonoscopic dutation of cecal volvulus, unlike a sigmoid volvulus, is technically challenging. Please doctor, can you summarize your lecture and tell us what are the recommendations? The majority of patients with cecal volvulus have full axial rotation, causing twisting of the mesentery and blood vessels. In approximately 20% of cases, the sacum and ascending colon fold in an anterior cephalad direction, known as a cecal bascule. The clinical presentation is highly variable, ranging from insidious, intermittent episodes of abdominal pain to an acute abdominal catastrophe. The physical examination typically reveals a distended and tympanic abdomen. Computerized tomography scan, CT scan, demonstrates the world sign twisting of the mesentery around the alleocolic vessels, which is pathognomonic of an axial cecal volvulus. CT scan confirms the diagnosis of a cecal volvulus in approximately 90% of patients, the remainder are diagnosed intraoperatively. Plain abdominal films are insufficient to correctly diagnose cecal volvulus in most patients. For patients with a cecal volvulus and a completely mobile scum and ascending colon not attached to the posterior parietal peritoneum, we suggest a right colectomy. If only the scum is mobile, a more limited aleocolic resection can be performed. There is essentially no risk of a recurrent cecal volvulus following a right colectomy. If an aleocolic resection is performed, a colopexy should be considered. We suggest not performing non-operative procedures, such as colonoscopy or reduction barium enema, for dutation of a cecal volvulus. Thank you Dr. Atf Ahmad, for your excellent presentation. Thanks for all. Hope all enjoyed the lecture. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you again in next lectures and presentations. Do not forget to share and like the video. With my best wishes. Dr. Atf Ahmad and visit my website. DrAtf.net <laughs>